الكريم وصلى الله وسلم على سيد النبي المرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين اما بعد. So I just want to share with you guys a uh, statement uh, of Hakim Rusli. He said that the one who is in haste speaks before he knows, answers before he understands, praises before trying, and condemns after praising. The hasty person is always accompanied by regret and is far from well being. The Arabs used to call it the mother of regret. So when we speak about hastiness or when we talk about hastiness, what are some things that come to mind? Yes? Um, getting through your prayers really fast. Okay, so this is a type of hastiness. Hastiness in, in good deeds, right? Try, or rushing to get through good deeds. What else? Yes? Impatience. Sure, it's a type of impatience. Uh, and when we talk about impatience, what does that look like? And, and, I, and I think sabr, our patience, is a topic that probably needs its own discussion. But very quickly, when we say uh, somebody's impatient, they're impatient with what? Their desires. With their desires, meaning that they want something to happen right now. Right now, right? They want something to happen immediately, and, be, and it's not happening on their time. So that's something that needs exploration. You know, why is that the case? Why is it that I need something to happen on my time, and what kind of importance am I giving myself for that to happen? But I want to share a couple of ayats with you guys. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Quli kazim sanu min ajid, that man was created of haste. And another verse Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, wa kanu insana ajula, man is ever hasty. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he also said, laqad khalaqna insana ahsani taqlima, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, I've also made you in the most perfect form. So what does that tell us about hastiness? Allah said that it is part of our nature to be hasty, yes, based on these verses, and that hastiness is an inherent, inherent characteristic that you have. But he also said that he's made us in the most perfect form. Do these contradict? Hmm. Yes or no? Superficially, yeah, they look like they contradict. So how do we explain it, right? It's not possible that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to tell us contradictory statements, or make contradictory statements. So how do we reconcile them? Nobody has any way to reconcile it? Yes? In case you just use the proper standard, mm -hmm. it, can, it can be towards like a better Okay, so if I'm understanding what you're saying, meaning that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is informing us and saying that, hey, listen, you tend to lean toward hastiness, but because I've made you in the most perfect form, you have the ability to what? Right. And that's a different type of hastiness, right? So you either, the hastiness here, and that's another explanation that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about, is that you have this inherent or inclination to be hasty toward doing good deeds, right? So if an individual rushes to do good deeds, and right, we usually don't use the word hasty, right, in, in English to talk about that, but when we talk about ajid in Arabic, it actually expresses both, right? You can, you can have a hurriedness toward doing good deeds, or you can have a hastiness toward doing good deeds. And also, if we look at the negative aspect, right, because there are two types of hastiness. There's going to be positive and there's going to be negative. And we'll talk about some of those differences and some of those types. But in this regard, if we assume that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is only talking about in good things, there are other verses to actually show otherwise. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he talks about Yunus alayhi salam. You guys know the, the verses, are you familiar with the verses about him or the story of Yunus? Hmm? All right, what happened with Yunus? Who knows the story? Very quickly. I'm not, I'm not asking for details. Yes? Yunus I said he was sent to other people. Mm -hmm. And after trying for um, what would. Some guess, time. For some time, right? Yeah. His hastiness got the best of him. He felt like they weren't, they weren't listening to the message. And so he okay. decided to leave. Okay. Um, and that was a mistake on his part. Mm -hmm. He was a lot of time had him, you know, there was intentionally had him be swallowed by a whale. Yeah. Uh, and then he had time to contemplate the mm -hmm. whale. And, and how do we know that was hastiness? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, He says, be patient. Be patient with the order of your Lord. And, and he's talking to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And do not be like the one who left his people. Do not be like the one who left his people, showing us that the opposite of hastiness is, is patience. So 
is it possible that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he talks about this urjwa, right, when he talks about this idea of hastiness, it actually applies to both good and to bad. So if we understand that it is part of our nature, if we understand it's part of our nature to be hasty, it means that we can channel that to make sure that that hastiness is being used for good. And the bad elements and the bad aspects of hastiness, we have an ability to overcome them and control them. And these things are very important to keep in mind. Uh, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa he also shares with us about Musa alayhi salam and his story with Khidr. And we all, we're all familiar with the story of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So what happened? There were, how many instances happened before Khidr said, okay, listen, we have to part ways now. One, two, three, that's something good. So there were three instances of that happened. But the, the first one was the hole in the boat, the second one is where he killed the child, and the third was the, the wall. The wall. Right? And then after that, after Musa questioned him on all three of these, he said what? Pilate fit off and the Right? That this is where we're going to separate and this is where we're going to split. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi he comments on this. He says, may Allah have mercy on Musa. Had he not been hasty, he would have learned far more stories than we did. So this idea of hastiness um, is, is not something that happens to just the commoners. This is something that even happens to who? Some of the prophets. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he addressed the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Fasubin bi He said, be patient with Allah's command. And here, who is he telling to be patient? He's telling the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So this this idea of being patient and this idea of fighting this this inherent hastiness that we all have, it is something that starts from the prophets and by extension it descends to us. So what causes that hastiness? Why are we rushed? Why is it that we, we want things to happen on our, on our time? And there are a number of examples of this, right? So we, we talked about the story of Musa, we talked about the story of Yunus, alayhi salam, and we have the story of our beloved messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Right, so Jibreel, he used to come to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with revelation. And he used to recite to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would what? Hmm? He would recite back, right? He would recite back to him. But as Jibreel was reciting the Prophet, what did he start doing? He started reciting with him. He started reciting with him, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Do not be haste with the Quran before its revelation is made complete to you and say, My Lord, increase me in knowledge. So, again, this is not a characteristic that is unique to the lay Muslim, to the lay person. This is something that even it was manifested in the prophets in different ways and in different forms. Obviously not in the same extent that we face and that we deal with it. But again, this is not something that is meant to be unique to us, right, as, as regular people, as regular Muslims. So we said that haste is of two types. Uh, those two types of haste are what? Hmm? Good and bad, right? There's, there's blameworthy and there is uh, uh, praiseworthy haste. So. Hastiness, in one of the examples you guys mentioned, is when you pray, right? If, if I'm getting going through and I'm hurrying with my prayer, this is something that actually can be a cause for the prayer to be rejected, right? But you guys know the story of the man who was praying in front of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, right? So he was praying, and then he was leaving, and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, He said, go back and pray, because you, you haven't prayed. And then he did the same thing again. And then the same thing, uh, the Prophet Sallallahu responded. Then the third time he responded, then he finally said to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, Ya Rasul, this is all I know. Like, th this, is, this is how I know. He said, teach me how to pray. Teach me how to pray. So the Prophet Sallallahu he told him how to pray, and he said, take your time, you know, make sure that all your bones are settled, etc. You know, to that in the hadith. So, again, this is something that requires exploration. Why is, it, why is it that we rush through these prayers? Why is it that we rush through these deeds? And there are certain things that we take our time with. And it's important for us to kind of be cognizant on why it is that we develop this hierarchy in our hearts. You know, why is this thing more important and why am I willing to give time to it? And why is it that I'm willing to give less time to this action, to this thing? Some things that we're also hasty with. Hasty when we're making dua. It, so for some of us, it, it just becomes a routine, right? There might be certain idea or certain dua that we're familiar with. And we just kind of make them because it's a, it's a habit now. It's not something that we you know, engage in. It's not something that we actually spend time with. And some of us will make dua so quickly, we need to ask ourselves, why am I not making more dua? Why am I not asking? Why am I not making that engagement? 
and, and again, these are questions that we should we, that I want to spend some time and I want to talk with you all about. Uh, seeking knowledge. Uh, Imam Zuhri, a uh, very famous muhaddith, uh, one of the imams of actually, uh, Imam Bukhari, he said, whoever expects to attain knowledge all at once, it will leave him all at once. And it's, it's not possible to learn everything in one go. Even the Quran, it was revealed uh, over a period of, what? Uh, 23 years, right? And, and why is that? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says that. He said, in the thabbit, the people, uh, so that we, we can bring certainty to your heart, so we can firm your heart. And that you can truly understand the depth and the nature of this book and the nature of this revelation and how important it is. And even like all of you guys are studying now. Well, how, how come you don't you don't just do everything in one year? Why not have like a six month crash course for like a bachelor's program? Because it's not possible, right? It's cumulative. Well, supposedly, huh? <laughs> it's cumulative. Like you guys, there's there one on one classes, and, right? There are two hundred level classes, and then you guys specialize. You're going on to like four hundred level classes. Why? Because it builds on all of that previous information, and and it's not dissimilar to how the Quran was descended, right? Even even the first thirteen years, you're talking about more than half of the prophethood. Was it focused on you need to pray like this, and you need to stand like this, and you need to give this percentage? You need, what was it focused on? It was focused on Tawheed, it was focused on Imaniya, it was focusing on building the hearts of the Muslims. All of these ahkam and all of these rulings, like the rulings concerning hijab, the rulings concerning the prayer, the rulings concerning the zakat, the rulings concerning riba. When did all that come? That actually came in the second half of the prophethood. Some of it even came in the later half. You, you guys know what some of the last verses to be revealed to the Prophet Islam were? On what subject? Hmm. Riba. Right, so the verses of Riba were actually some of the last verses to be revealed to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So we have to understand, like there, there is a cumulative knowledge base that the Prophet had was building, and this is how the companions were built, and this is how students are built. Right, students they have to be built up. They can't they can't just be given everything at once, and it's not even possible to retain all that information all at once, which is why everything has to be given piecemeal. Earning money. Right. This this is another this is another one, um, and and I think that we we actually live in an era where this has become even more magnified. Right, where where people want to get rich very quickly, and and this is something that we really need to spend time with, and something that we we really need to talk about, uh, and and even understanding the the different mindsets that we as individuals have, and some people have that day to day mindset. Some people have the stability mindset. Some people have a long-term mindset. How do we? What is the Islamic mindset that we should have? Because does Islam discourage us from learning? Does here? Let me ask the question in a different way. Does Islam encourage poverty? No, it does. It doesn't. It just gives us guidelines on what to do if we are ever in that situation. But it doesn't encourage an individual to actually go out and to seek poverty and to be poor. Um, hasten one thing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to change others. Right, so how, how many times is it that um, in, in judgment, like being judgmental actually stems from this? When we tell someone, well, you need, you, need to, you, need, you need to pray like this, or you need to do this, or you need to fix that, or you know, you're not doing this correctly, where does that actually stem from? And, and this is something that many of us complain about, right? Like we, there are certain spaces that we don't want to enter, there are certain spaces we don't want to go into because we feel like we are being judged. And the question we need to ask ourselves is like, okay, well if I don't like those spaces, why is it okay for me now to speak about others and to tell them what to do or how to live their lives? And someone might say, well isn't that nasiha? Well the question then comes, what is nasiha? What is actually advising others? And what does that look like? How does that manifest itself? And is it appropriate appropriate for every single person to give every single piece of advice? Right? That's not always the case. So these are just some examples that I shared, and let's go back through them. And I, this is where I want to kind of open up the discussion on the. And I focus on the blameworthy first because I think that is a problem that most of us face, in terms of being rushed and hurried to do good things or in a praise like the praiseworthy type of rush. I, I think. Encouraging those characteristics are much easier, and I think actually solving these are more problematic and more difficult. So when we talk about haste in prayer, firstly, what are some things that we can do to make sure that we're not being hasty in our prayer? I think that's something that's that's an important conversation. Why are we being hasty in our prayer is another important conversation. 
Okay, so let's start with the why. What is what are some reasons that we rush through our prayer? And we can talk about at the end, inshallah, we'll talk about just general reasons of why we rush or why we're hurry. But I'm curious to hear from you why is it that we in general might rush through our prayers? Something we're doing. All right, so it be, because we feel that the prayer is what it's it's taking away from something else. Right? So if I'm in the middle of a game, or maybe um, and, and I'm not sure this has happened to somebody. You're in the middle of class, the prayer time's ending. You need to step out and you want to get back into class. It, it happens. So sometimes logistic reasons. You know, e either uh, what you mentioned was an importance reason. The second one could be a, a logistic one, right? So the is it important that I attend class? Right, depending on the class, right? No, but like, <laughs> is it important I defend class? I attend class. Yes. Is it also important that I that I pray? Um, is it important that I finish watching the show at this time? Right. And and, and all of these things are. It's a lot of self evaluation that we have to do, and having those internal personal conversations. That it's it's not always easy to have those conversations and to really remind ourselves of what the purpose was and why it is that I'm engaging in this action or why I'm giving preference to one over the other. So if I'm in the middle of a game, if I'm playing something and I step away, well, is, is that game important? And, and, and I want you guys to be honest with this question. Is, is that game or spending time or social, socializing, are those things important? They are. Otherwise, if they weren't, I wouldn't be rushing through my prayer, correct? So that's, that's the first honest conversation I need to have with myself. We might say that it's not important, but if it wasn't, then why would I be giving it preference? Yes? So I, I think also embracing that. For me to socialize and spend time with my friends, or be, for me to play that game, or for me to whatever it is that I'm watching, it's fine that those things are important, correct? Is it, is it bad that I'm giving those things important? No, there, there's nothing wrong with that, right? You know, going to work or spending time with my friends or studying or whatever, whatever the case might be, those things being important in and of themselves, it's not a problem. And, and why is it not a problem? Because none of those things are haram. It's only when, the, when I'm engaged in something that's impermissible that I have no right to say that that thing is important. It's only the haram things that are unimportant. It's only the haram things I need to stay away from. But if I'm doing something that's jazz, if I'm doing something that's permissible, then I have every right to engage in that thing. But now we'll start. We start entering the realm of how, what, and what engages or what encompasses or what is Islam, right? What is extravagance? How do I know that I'm being extravagant in this thing? How do I know I'm spending too much time with my friends? How do I know that I'm watching too much? How do I know that I'm reading too much? How do I know that I'm spend, spending too much? And that's, a, that's an important conversation. But that is saw discussion many times, and, and there are other conditions to it, but many times I can tell myself, I know, I know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given me that heart as a compass and as a gauge to help me determine when I'm spending too much time. And I know, if I'm being honest with myself, that, man, I'm just giving this too much time. Or I'm spending too much time with my friends. And how do I know that? Because when my friends ask me, like, hey, listen, you want to go hang out? You want to go chill? And my heart is saying, like, nah, dude, like, this, this is not a good idea. That you, you, have, you have these things that you need to take care of. But I still say, yes. So how do I determine in general? And like I said, there are guidelines and there are other things that we can talk about. But I would say that the first red flag, the first red flag I have as an individual that there's a problem with what I'm being requested to do or what I'm spending time with. And sometimes it doesn't have to be a request, right? I can just be sitting and I can be doing something. I know myself and I can tell myself, like, look, I'm spending too much time with this. I, I need to do something about it. And if that red flag is going off, then I need to do something. And my accountability begins because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can ask me. And he, and he can tell me, he'd be like, well, you know, didn't, didn't, you, didn't you feel something? Didn't you feel that you were doing something wrong? Didn't you feel that there was a problem there? And I have no right to respond. I can't be like, oh, well, the sheikh told me it was had. Allah's not going to care what the sheikh or the imam or the mufti, what he said. He's going to hold me accountable for what I felt. And the Prophet ﷺ tells us very clear, clearly. He said, He says, ask your heart, even if the people give you fatwa. 
so a, a, a scholar, imam, mufti, whatever, he might tell me, like, this thing is permissible, and my heart is still telling me, no, don't do this. Don't engage in this. This isn't good for you. And if I still choose not to listen, then that's where I'm going to be accountable. And sometimes we need more information, and we need more clarity, and I think that's good. I think that's healthy. And sometimes our heart can trick us as well, yes? Right? We, we, we can't trust our hearts 100%, which is why we have to ask, which is why we get that information. We have to make sure that we're making correct decisions, and that requires knowledge, and it requires that level of spirituality. So these things get together actually help us make sound decisions. All right, so well, that's part of the why, right? Because we, I don't think we're honest with ourselves and where we're gauging things and how important they are and how important the prayer is. So what are some things I can do? How can I better that? If I don't feel like I'm, I'm focused enough in prayer, what are some spiritual things that I can do and what are some practical things I can do? Yes? Um, I heard someone say before that during the tahiyyat, some people just rush the tahiyyat. Yeah. So imagine if Prophet uh, Muhammad so, so, so. were to come through uh, that door, for example, mm -hmm. how would you say salam to him? You would mm -hmm. say properly and you wouldn't rush it. Yeah. So I think that's how we would do okay. it. Okay. Yeah. Putting, putting that spiritual perspective, that's extremely important. Yes? I guess something more practical would be um, if you take the time to, at least for the different positions in Salah, mm -hmm. like you memorize uh, the, you know, the, the saints, you know, and so you mm -hmm. look the meanings and you kind yeah. of like, it adds a little more for sure. Absolutely. You're focusing on the meaning. Good. And of course, you can go even further than that and look at the, the meaning of the seer of the surah, of the mm -hmm. surah that you're reciting mm -hmm. during the prayer. Excellent. So, there, there are two levels and two layers to what you said. Number one, at the minimum, learn what it is that I'm saying, right? I, if I'm going to the prayer and I'm just par parroting a lot of these words, how much impact are they going to have on me and my heart, right? There'll be some. There's baraka. There's, you know, what I mean, there's a, uh, there's a blessing in that. There's no doubt about it. But if I learn the meaning of them, like even the Quran, was the Quran sent to be parroted by us, right? That that we just learn the, how to read the words. And then we just recite it, and that's it. There, there's blessing in it. There's no doubt, right? There's baraka, and there's a healing in the Quran. I, I, like, I don't think anybody doubts this. But was that the purpose of the Quran? Just to seek blessing from the words on the page? It, it's, it's meant to be a guideline. It's meant to be a manual. And if I'm not treating it like that, why is it going to have an effect on me? Why is it going to have an effect on my heart? So we need to make sure that when we're praying, you know, even the Prophet Sallallahu when the companions were asked about the prayer, they said that the Prophet Sallallahu taught us the Tahiyya, he taught us the Dua Ibrahimiya, just the same way as he taught us what? The Qur'an. That's how much importance that he Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam gave to this. That he actually sat down and he made sure that they're pronouncing correctly, make sure they understand what the words are, and they're spending time with it. And not just that, what is the most important pillar after the Shahadat Din? The Salah. The Prophet Sallallahu he said, the difference between us and the Mushrikeen are what? Is what? It's the prayer. Right? This is something, it is so fundamental. It is so fundamental that we have to make it important in our hearts. We have to make it important in our lives. And for some people, I know it's a challenge. I know it's difficult. But even the amazing thing with that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, all he wants us to do is just wants us to make a little bit of effort. Can anyone here raise their hand and say, I deserve everything that I've received? Can, can I say that I deserve the health that I've been given? Or I deserve the eyesight that I have? Or I deserve the ability to sit in a room where I'm relatively safe? Like, it, we, we really live amongst all these blessings. And how many of us here can really say that we, we're deserving of those blessings? No one can say that. And anybody who does is complete arrogance. And if we understand that all the things are these things are a blessing, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is asking for four minutes, four to seven minutes to twelve minutes, depending on how long you you want to pray, is that really a big ask? And and not just that, he's given us windows, right? He's given us windows to pray. He's not saying you have you have to pray at 1 30, right? There's there's no there's no obligation for me to pray at that time. The yeah, Azawajah so is saying, listen, I've given you this window. Pray in whatever is easy for you to pray. The only thing I don't want you to do is go outside of that window. That's it. It's, it's not a big ask. So we have to learn to be thankful. We need to learn to have that spiritual perspective. We need to learn what it is that we're saying. Because that will further enrich in our prayer. And it'll help, help us understand why it is that we're praying. Even the prayer itself, 
Why is it that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, why did he choose prayer? So out of all the pillars, right, you know, so you have like reading Quran, making du'a, right, you know, helping others, doing all these things. Why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala choose these five pillars? Why? Amongst all the actions, right, there's a lot of actions that we as individuals can do. Why did he choose the shahadatain? Why did he choose the prayer? Why did he choose zakat? Why did he choose fasting? Why did he choose hajj? Why these five? Because these are the deeds that he loves the most. Very simply. And if I know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves these deeds, then I should make it an effort for myself to make sure that I love them as well. And if I find that I embrace the prayer, and I love the prayer, and I, and I, and I enjoy that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will change my heart to that. And if I if I'm, have any shortcomings in it, guess what I have to do? I just have to change my mindset. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promises me. And he tells me, he says, well, may yata Right? Whoever has God consciousness, whoever has this awareness, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make a way for them. And sometimes it could be like, man, I don't know, I have this like this really cool teacher, or like, you know, between switching classes, blah, blah. Allah will make a way. Allah will make a way. I just need to have the right mindset and I need to make that effort. That's it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he, he doesn't look at the results. He doesn't. He looks at the direction and the effort that we make. And if we make an honest effort, Allah will open up all the pathways that we seek and the ones that we look for. Like, why are we uh, hasty in making du'a? How come we don't? How come we don't spend more time making du'a? Like, active du'a? Yes? We don't always see that immediate results from that. Right? So we, we, we are a people that enjoy instant gratification. Right. Uh, especially living in, in an era where everything is surrounded by and based on instant gratification. Right. If I if I want something, what can I do? I can just like you know get on Uber Eats, right? And I, it'll just come, it'll come to my door, literally. If, if we if we think about we live in an amazing era, right? like technologically, like it's it's I, I'm like I'm I'm flying out tomorrow, and it's just amazing to me that I'm sitting on a couch in the sky, right? <laughs> it's it's just it's it's amazing. Like you know we just live in this era where I can get from one part of the globe to another part of the globe in in a few hours where it used to take a few days. And, and we really need to be thankful of all of these things that we have. And, you know, I, re I remember growing up, it's like, I used to, uh, I used to argue with my dad about like turning on the AC when it was like really hot. And it was like, you know, I was just like, no, I was like, turn the fan on, open your window, you know what I mean? And, and now it's like, when I feel hot, I'm like, Alexa, turn on the AC. You know, it, it's, it's just amazing. We just live in a completely different time frame. And, and we really need to be thankful for those things. Okay. But we're, we're, not, we're not making enough da. We're not making enough da. There's no doubt about that. Uh, some other reasons. Why aren't we making enough da? Or why aren't we making more da? We don't fully fill up with Allah. All right, we, we don't fully trust Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And, and I'm not saying that we don't, right? In general, I, I think Muslims do. But we, we haven't reached that next level, right? So what in taqwa and sabah, all these, these, are, these, are, these are spectrum, right? So someone might have less, someone might have more. So why is that? What, why do we not trust Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala more? And, and it might connect back to the first reason. We're not seeing the results. Because we're not seeing the results, right? And is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he, he tells us, he says, are there only fastidic people? Right? He says, he says, call on me, I'll answer. Right? Immediately. He said, there's no delay. The moment you call on me is the same, in that same moment, I'm going to answer you. All right, well, how, how do I deal with that? Allah's promising. He said, listen, you make du'a, I'm going to answer it. Hmm. All right, there are different ways. All right, just because I'm asking for something, does it mean that it's going to come to me in the way that I want it to? Not necessarily. And the Prophet Islam, he explained this to us as well, right? So he said that... Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does answer every du'a. And sometimes he'll give it to you in this world. And sometimes he will save it to you in the next world. Sometimes he'll use that du'a as a means to repel something evil from you. So there are different ways that that du'a manifests. But a lot of this has to go back with understanding divine wisdom. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he chooses. right? He chooses what he wants to answer and he chooses what he, what he doesn't want to answer. The other problem I think many of us have is that do good things happen to bad people? Yeah, and do bad things happen to good people? And, and sometimes it's, it's difficult for us, like when we see these things, to reconcile. Be like, 
hand, like I'm praying, I'm fasting, I'm doing all these things, and like I'm still having a hard time, or I'm still I still can't get a job, or I'm still not doing well in this class. But this guy's a shape on, and like you know what I mean, like he's he's just succeeding. And, 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 and like we felt that dissonance in our minds, like you know how how is that? Well, let's try that. He he doesn't promise a one to one. Like our relationship with Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, it's not a zero sum game. Right? It's not like, okay, you pray to me and I'm going to give you a nice house. Right? <laughs> or if you fast and I'm going to give you a nice car. Or if you make hajj, you know you're going to get a nice job. That's, that's not how the relationship works. Everything we have, like we had mentioned, we're not deserving of it. And we do it because he's deserving of being worshipped. It's very simple. And however he decides to test me, that's up to him. I have no control over that. I can't, I can't say anything about how, how it is and what it is. I have to accept it, and I have to move forward, and I have to continue being thankful for what I have. And it's not easy, right? It's not easy. It can be very challenging. It can be very difficult. But at the end of the day, who am I? And, and, and I think that's a very difficult conversation, too. It's like, who am I? Why should I get these things? It doesn't mean I can't ask. Right? I can ask for whatever I want. But if Allah chooses not to give them to me, that's his prerogative. And it's out, out of his wisdom. Some people will ask for wealth. Maybe Allah gives it to them and it's a means for them to go astray. Or maybe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes something away from someone and, and we don't see the wisdom behind it. We don't. It's very challenging. But it's something that we have to make sure that we're keeping perspective of. I think another reason we fall out of dua is like because we don't do enough. Like we, it's just not part of our routine. It's not part of our habits. And if, if I want to converse with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I have to initiate that conversation. And I actually have to sit down and I have to have that conversation with him as a widget. And, and those conversations are, are not always easy because they are the ones that actually, actually strip away the layers of our nafs and our self. And, and, and those faults that we see in ourselves. Sometimes we look in the mirror and, and frankly, we, we won't see who we like, right? Like, we might see a cat. We might see somebody who's cheap. Right? We might see somebody who's dishonest. But... Just the fact that I saw those things, that is a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why? Or is it not? It is? Why is it, why is it a blessing? Character of humility. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed me to see my shortcomings. What can I do now? I can work on them. Like that, that's the amazing thing. If I don't like a certain characteristic, guess, guess what I can do? I can change it. The Prophet he said, he said that knowledge is with seeking it, with hayn bitahalum, and forbearance is by practicing it. Basically, the Prophet is telling us what? He said, fake it till you make it. It's okay. If, if you want to be generous, is that an overnight shift, an overnight change? No, man. Like, I have to practice being generous. I have to learn to take away that connection that I have with that love. If I'm not courageous, I need to, I need to step into places and I need to deal with people, not in a way where I'm aggressive, where I'm willing to challenge them. If somebody says something in front of me that is completely out of pocket, I have to say something. I don't have to be insulting, right? But I can be like, you know, I don't, I don't know about that. Like, I, I, don't, I don't think that's a fair statement. Or, what do you mean by that? Yes, sir. I think another reason that I'm hesitant when it comes to making dua, and also in relation to the situation that you're in. So, uh, there's a tendency for people to make more dua, at least from what I've seen, when they're facing a hardship. Yeah. hardship, yeah. Uh, when it comes to good times, though, when you have alhamdulillah, you have multiple, you know, yeah, man, blessings, right? It's easier to fall in the love now, right? So, yeah. the person, you know, as opposed to, you know, being consistent with your God, mm -hmm. uh, you know, even outside of the prayer, yeah. uh, just consistently making God, you're only making God during the times of hardship when you actually need Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or it should be the other way around, where you're both asking for his protection in good times and bad times, uh, and just yeah. general God. Yeah, that, I mean, the Prophet said, he said, I'm a mu'min kullu ajr. He said the affair of the woman is strange, right? He says that when good happens to him, he is what? He's thankful. And when bad happens to him, he is what? He's patient. So there should always be this constant conversation because the thing is, even when things are good, and when we think of things being good, we think of physically and superficially, right? We think that I have wealth and I'm healthy, right? You know, I have a family, everybody's happy. And, and that is good. There's nothing wrong with any of those things. But... At that, it is at that moment and those opportunities I can really spend more time introspecting and building up and fixing my character. Just because everything is all right over here doesn't mean that everything is right over here. And, and, and that's what requires work. 
And because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given me this moment of clarity, or this, or this moment of rest, right? Because it is. That, that's all it is. It's this moment of rest where I have a moment where I have some wealth and things are stable, everybody's healthy, what is that? Take this opportunity to introspect. Right? This, this is your vacation to go and be, be more brave, to be more honest, to be more upright, to be more trustworthy. I want people to rely on me because I want to be a trustworthy person. I want people to be able to engage with me because they know that I'm courageous and they know that I'm going to stand up for people who are oppressed. I want people to come and talk to me because I know I'm honest. Right? Th these are the things that will really change an individual's relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In, in, in subhanAllah, it's actually a very simple gauge. Someone might be like, okay, well, I don't know where I stand with Allah. Okay, where do you stand with the people around you? Are people hesitant in coming to talk to you? Are people intimidated by you? Are people scared of you? Or do, do people cringe a little, you know, when you walk into a room? Right? These, these are things that we really need to ask ourselves. And if people are worried, and if people have these feelings, then I, I have a troubled relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because I haven't reached that level of taqwa. I haven't reached that level of awareness where I'm actually seeing that the problem is here. And I need to fix that. And how do I fix that? Again, it's just a matter of practicing those good characteristics and making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He blesses us. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us all good characteristics. I mean, uh, securing provision. Why are we why are we so hasty in the running after wealth? So I think one reason is that it's because because of social media, the acquisition of wealth looks like it has become what? Like really easy. And and it seems like everybody's wealthy. Uh, and how many how many of those social media posters or the social media you know uh, what, do you, what do you call them? Influencers, is that that, right? How many of these influencers are actually wealthy? It's actually a small percentage, right? It's not, not a lot of them are, are really wealthy. So what is it that they're doing? You know, I, I don't know if you guys have seen this, but uh, there's this guy who, who bought a fuselage of a plane, and he put in, like, luxury stuff inside the plane, and people go and rent time on that plane, on, in the fuselage, to put on their Instagram. Like, like they're living like this baller life. And it's, it's all fake. Right? It's all fake. And it, I, I, was, I was more shocked. I was like, man, I didn't even realize this was a thing. And he's doing well. Like, he's doing well as a business that, you know, he has all these people coming and renting. And, like, they're showing off that, oh, this is my dear jet. And this is where I'm going. And this is where I'm flying to. And, and they're not going anywhere. They're sitting on the ground in, like, a quarter of a plane. Right? <laughs> so it's not even a real thing. So... But the problem is, is the appearance of that makes it that much more attractive. Right? When, when you see people who might be in similar in age or might even be younger, and all of a sudden they're making it appear like they're extremely wealthy and incredibly successful, we start asking ourselves, like, well, well why, can't, why can't I do that? And then what happens? We start looking for shortcuts. Right? And, and what do those shortcuts look like? It become, we start becoming dishonest. And we become willing to take advantage of others. We become willing to hate others. Like, d does Islam discourage pursuing self-interest? Like, does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala discourage me from pursuing uh, something to better my wealth and my situation? No? Okay. I agree. 100%. Like, when, when I'm seeking paradise, who am I seeking it for? So I'm, I'm seeking it for me. Like, I want to get to paradise, right? So I'm, I'm going to work. Where does that become a problem? It becomes a problem when I start taking the rights of others. Right? If, if I do it at the expense of others, this is where Islam has, has uh, created the limit and set the limit. And we call that one. We call that oppression. Right? When I'm doing something at the expense of someone else. Not just because I'm doing something for something. Right? If, if I'm working toward a particular house, or I'm working toward a particular car, or I'm working toward a particular job, all of those things are fine. The moment I start hurting others to attain them, that's where I'm going to be held accountable, and that's where all this kind of data it can punish. But we also have to understand spiritually, when it comes to our sustenance, and when it comes to our artists, Allah has made some, something very clear, and what is that? It's written. Hmm? It's, written. it's written, right? Everything that I have is, is written. I am only going to receive X amount in my life. 
period. I'm not going to get more than that, and I'm not going to get less than that. So how should I be using my time? If I know that what is written for me is written, how much time should I be spending, spending in the pursuit of that welfare? Zero, all right, let's, let's do a scale, zero to 100. Should I be spending zero time? No, okay, we, that we agree on. Should I be spending all my time? Absolutely not. Okay, so how do I judge on how much time I should be spending? And it goes back to a very important point that we discussed just previously. I'm allowed to spend as much time as it takes as long as I want. Uh, as long as I don't take the rights of others. That's where it matters, and that's where it's important. And how do I determine that? If my family is not, no, I guess I'm running out of battery? No, never good. Right. Uh, so if my children don't feel like I'm spending enough time with them, what have I done? I've infringed on their rights, right? Because they have a right to their father. If my wife doesn't feel like I'm spending enough time with her, then I've infringed on her rights. If my job, if my boss complains, that means that I'm infringing on his rights. And learning how to create that balance, it's, it's not easy, right? It's, it's, it's actually very difficult. But out of all of this, who are some people that it doesn't, it affects them less if I take their rights? Or I, I won't even say rights. And, and this is usually the people we give the most time to. Yes? Your friends. Our friends. <laughs> and and it's, it's actually amazing. Because friendship is a completely voluntary relationship. Right? If, if I decide one day to be like, hey, listen, I don't want to be friends anymore, that's it, right? <laughs> that's all it takes. But can I, can I walk up to my brother and be like, hey, listen, we're not brothers anymore? Right? There, there are certain relationships that we don't have a choice in. And not just that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually commands us to invest in those relationships. Like, these are the relationships you have to keep. And I, I think, do we have, we have a talk on relationships, right? Yeah, okay. Cool. So I, won't, I won't get too much into it, but... Is it possible that I have a, a better, um, I have a better relationship with a friend than I do with my brother? Yeah, right. It, it happens. Right. Some, sometimes there's certain like brothers don't get along. Sometimes brothers and sisters don't get along. And sometimes they have a better relationship with certain friends. And there's nothing wrong with that. Right. There's nothing wrong with that. But at the end of the day, we need to understand that friends, friends are a voluntary relationship, and they should be the most understanding. So it's like, hey, listen, man. I actually I, I gotta work. It's like, okay, cool. You know what I mean? Like. We'll, we'll catch up whenever. But we tend to be the most shy when we're dealing with our friends and the most shy in telling them no. But like I said, that's, that's a separate conversation and how to kind of define those lines and draw them, I think is something that's important. Like wanting, to, wanting people to change. Why, why are we hasty in that? It's like, man, I told him that he's afraid, but he's not afraid. Yes? Uh, I mean, I don't know, perhaps, maybe in that example, like, yeah. It seems to be like a like high level of like urgency. Like, what if he, what if this person passes away tomorrow? Like, yeah, yeah. Change. Yeah, yeah. Right okay. You're you're right. Like, man, like, well, he needs to change right now, right? He needs to get better right now, right? But before something bad happens to him spiritually. Like, and that can be out of care, right? It can definitely be out of love. Uh, but how do I reconcile that? Yes. Uh, maybe like a way to find like rest in that is that like you don't decide whether or not like, this person uh, you know has like the energy to do whatever, pray, do mm -hmm. work, whatever. Yeah. Like that. Oh, is, is guidance in my hand? Our guidance isn't in my hand. Allah's fine with that. He said to the Prophet Muhammad, he says, In the Kalatahdi man ahbat. He said, You don't guide who you love. Right? He, he didn't say you don't guide who you like, <laughs> or you don't, or you don't guide who's you know an okay person. He said he said even the people who you love, you have no control over their guidance. Your job is to what? I'm sorry. Advice, like relay the message. That's it. And even advice, that it's it's a very fine line. It's a very fine line. Does advice mean that I walk up to someone and be like, hey, listen, you need to start praying? No. Well, why won't that work? Am I saying anything wrong? Should like shouldn't he start praying? Uh, like, why why is it wrong? Why is that a problem? 
Yes. I guess it's, it's not in a manner that shows that like you care about them and they're out there. It's just like, yeah. oh, you should pray. Yeah. And, and, and unfortunately, a lot of this stems from arrogance. Like a lot of this stems from arrogance, right? The fact that he needs to be guided. Why does he need to be guided? Because I'm telling him. And what, what makes me that authority? I guess it also be like having established the foundation of the importance. Mm. So by the statement and saying, like, hey, you have to pray, you got to do this more. Yeah. You have to be like, okay, well, where's this coming from? Yeah. Rather than explaining the importance to it, so it can create a. Well, I'm, I'm saying even, even that, even before all of that, right. how do I advise someone? Like, and, and, and very simply, what is the first step of advising? Someone asks you. Right, that's part of it. That's part of it. What else? Building a relationship. Building a relationship, that's it. I'll show you pay attention. <laughs> building a relationship. That's it. Like if I want to advise someone, I have to build a relationship with that person in order for them to allow me into a space that will actually you know what I mean, that that's conducive to advising. If I'm just walking up to random random people telling them what to do, how, how does that come across? It comes across as abrasive, right? It comes across as assertive. And, and, and not just that. Will, when people see you, when people see you, it's like, oh man, this is the guy that goes around telling everyone, telling everyone like, grow your beard, or going, telling everyone to like, you know, lower their gaze, or telling everyone to do this. What happens to that person within social circles? I'm sorry? Where he becomes an outcast. Now, because when people see him, what are they going to do? They're going to turn away. They're going to try to avoid conversing with him. They're going to try to avoid engaging with them. With the Prophet it was the opposite. It was the opposite. People looked forward to being in his company. They looked forward to being around him. You know why? Because he wasn't judgmental. And even when he advised, he always came from a place of love and always came from a place of care. And how did he do that? By building relationships with everyone around him. And there, there, were a couple, there were a couple layers to this, right? Number one, the fact that he built this relationship. Number two, he's, he was looked at as an authority, right? So when he said something, so I said to him, people would listen, right? They're like, oh no, this person, he's, he's getting revelation, right? He's receiving revelation, like, uh, like I, should, I need to listen to him. But when it comes to just another random Muslim, why should he choose your word over someone else? There's, there's always a piece of advice that I give to new Muslims. And one piece of advice that I give, I was like, listen, if you want to learn something, and if you have a question about something, always go back to community leaders. I said, because you'll talk to five Muslims and you'll get 20 different opinions. But the problem is, none of those people are in authority. So always go back to a community leader. Because that person was appointed by the community, and the community trusts him. But this person, like Ahmed, Khalid, and Khadija, who, who are they? Right? They, they, these people, they don't have any formal education, but like formal classical education. What gives them authority to even, how do you even know what they're saying is correct? So, building a relationship, and many times, something that we are all shy to do, is we have to be gateways for people. If someone comes to me with a problem, do I need to have the solution to all those problems? If someone comes to me and they say, hey man, just, listen, there's something wrong with, your, wrong with my car, I'll be like, alright, bet, bro, I got it, let's go, open up your hood. I, I'm probably going to break something else, right, if, if, if I take a look at it. What sh if I was a good friend and a true friend, what should I have done? Yes? Uh, I don't want to do this, but I can help you find someone that can. That's it, right? Let, let, me take, let, let me take you to a mechanic, right? So if I'm a good friend, I'm not going to take him to a plumber, right? I'm going to take him to, I'm going to take him to a mechanic. And it's the same thing with any, everything, every, anything. And sometimes it'd be like, bro, I, I don't know. I, 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 don't, I don't know. And, 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 and again, this, this idea of honesty, being honest with myself, so that I make sure that I am being honest with others. Uh, rushing to do good deeds, I think this is something that's really important. I just want to share a few examples from the uh, from the Quran. When Allah Subhanahu wa Taala talks about seeking worldly pursuits, He says, "Fumshu." He says, "Walk." He says, "Walk toward these these worldly pursuits." But when He talks about prayer, He says, "Fasal." Proceed. Okay, so it's, it's really interesting how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually uh, expresses these ideas and how he, he shares these ideas with us and how we are supposed to create that perception around differences, uh, whether it be worldly or whether it be spiritual. Um, rushing to restore rights to their owners. The Prophet said at one time he was praying and immediately after prayer he got up and he left, which is not his habit. 
Right? His habit was to sit down and make dhikr. He got up immediately, and then he came back. And the, they asked, yeah, so like, they're like, why were you in such a rush? What happened? He said, I remember I had I was holding something of someone else's, and I wanted to make sure that I returned it to them. You know, how many of us borrow things and we kind of sit on, <laughs> sit on them for like weeks on end? Right? And not just that, we sit on them for weeks at end, and then we, we give them back. It's like, yeah, bro, it stopped working. <laughs> it's, it's unfortunate. You know, it, it, and instead of being trustworthy and making sure that we're getting the amana back and giving the trust back to people, like it, it, our attitude should be. The, okay, as soon as I'm done with it, let me get it back to the person who owns it so that they have their amount of back, so that they have their trust back. And not just that, if I ask for something next time, what's going to happen? They're more willing to give it. Right? They're going to be more willing to share it. Uh, rushing to carry out hajj. The Prophet he said, whoever intends to perform hajj, let him hasten to do so, or he may fall sick, lose his mouth, or be faced with what need. So the Prophet here is saying, and we can apply this to all deeds. If I have an opportunity to do a good deed, when should I do it? I should do it immediately. I should do it right then. Because I don't know what's going to happen to me in the future. And I don't know what obstacles Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala might create. Uh, rushing to repent. So this is something that's really important. That from the characteristics of a believer is that the moment he does a bad deed, he does what? Hmm? And he repents. And, and part of that repenting, and, and that's something that's important because it's like, we, we all do bad deeds, right? And, and we keep doing bad deeds. And sometimes it can get to the point of being actually frustrating. It's like, man, I, I just keep following, falling into this bad deed. And, and, and I remember uh, there's was, there was a speaker one time, he was asked, you know, it's like, well, you know, you keep doing these bad deeds, like, don't, don't you kind of give up? And he, he responded, he's like, okay, well, when you were learning to walk, right, how many times did you fall down? He was like, well, you know, maybe like a few hundred times that you fall down. He's like, was there ever a time where you didn't get up? You're like, oh, forget it, now. I'm just going to fall down again. And it's the same thing, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he, he created us in that knowingly that we would do bad things. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's amazing how he's less concerned with the deed itself and more concerned with how we react to it. So we do have shortcomings, and we are weak, and we are hasty, right? And, and we do take advantage and we oppress others. But the more important characteristic is that we, we make tawbah, and we make istighfar, and we repent for those deeds that we've fallen into that we commit. So what causes haste in general? What are some things that cause us to be hasty? Impatience. Right, impatience, right? Stress, anxiety, that that right if, if I if I feel like if I feel like I'm being pressured, I'm going to I'm going to want to act quicker. What else? Greed. Huh? Alright, greed. Uh, Deadlines, right? So if I, if I have a deadline, I'm sure all of you experience this, right? Like you have a project that you have to submit, or if you have an upcoming exam, what happens? You start you start feeling that that tightness. What else? I'm sorry. Prioritizing. Prioritizing, right? Prioritizing or lack of planning, right? If if I'm not planning, if if I know I have a project due in like a month and a half, what should I probably start doing? So, right, I should start. <laughs> I should probably start working on it now. But if I start working at, on it like three days before it's due. Who, who should I blame? Right, I can only blame myself. I can only blame myself. And, and when I rush, what, what is the problem with rushing? I'll make mistakes, I'll overlook, I'll start cutting corners. Right? So these things are definitely problematic. Um, oh well. Right? Sometimes seeing other people do something, or they're like, you know, they're, they're signing up, or they want to attend something, and immediately, what, what's the first knee-jerk reaction? Say, I, I want to do that too, or I want to get involved in that too, or I, I want to participate as well. Uh, sometimes peer pressure, right? And, and and we had talked about this before that it's 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 actually really unfortunate. It's easier for me to say no to my family than it is to my friends. Why? E even though we said that when it, when it comes to relationships, friendships like on the totem pole are actually the lowest because they're completely voluntary. So the question is, is like why is it that group of people? Why is it harder to say no? Like no nah, man, I can't go out, or like, no nah, man, I can't hang out, or I can't do this, versus your parents. I mean, like, hey, listen, we're going here, and you're like, I don't know, man. Yes? It's because it is voluntary. Okay. It's because, like, you're, you want to do um, that, as opposed to your yeah. parents or your family, like, it's wedged, you know? Yeah, so, definitely. Why Why are these people my friends? Because you want Huh? Well, because I want them to be my friends. And, and why? Because we have shared interests. Mm -hmm. Yes? Somebody, I saw someone raise their hand. Yeah. 
also in terms of time. I'll come back to that. Okay, sure. I mean, there's, there's also, we, we all want to be part of a group, right? It, it, loneliness is terrifying, right? You, you, knowing that I don't have any friends and, and being willing to accept that I might not have these friends or my friends will turn me away, it's very terrifying, right? It's very scary because it's like, okay, well, I'm not, I'm not part of that group. And being scared of being removed from a group is actually very powerful. Okay? That, that's a lot of peer pressure stem, stems from that. And, and you'll find like, and, and, and it's, it's, it can be good or bad, right? If I choose to surround myself with people who are religious, the, night, the peer pressure there will be like, oh, you know, we gotta pray, we gotta do things, no man, like we're not gonna go, we don't, we don't do that, bro. Like, and it, it helps actually steer a person away from bad habits. It, it's very hard to internally actually stop bad habits. The best thing to do is create environments that take us away from them. That's the best we can do. Because it's very easy to fall into them. Yes? I was going to say, like, reputation. Yeah. So, it's, it's, it's the same thing, right? Like, I, I want to be associated with this group. I want to be part of this group. I want this, And I want this group to accept me. So if I say no, there's a chance that they'll what? That they'll reject me. And that they'll turn me away. And the reason that we're we, with family is, like, well, it doesn't matter what I say to them. They'll always be family, right? There's, there's nothing I can do about it. It doesn't matter how bad I react to them or how badly I deal with them. They'll forever be my family. Even though the Prophet he said the best of you is the one who's best to his family. And I'm the best to my family. Meaning that he used to give them preference. Right? He used to give them preference. And and with that, you don't find any of his friends complaining about not spending time with him. Right? His companions, none of them said, like, oh man, we, we, we didn't get enough time with the Messenger of Allah. So like, they, they all felt, and, and this is, it's an amazing trait. Right, that everybody feels like they're important around him. So it's, right, it's, it's actually amazing and it's wonderful. Just being a, being around an individual who makes you feel important. And this is how we should be. Like we should make others feel important. We should make others feel like, no, no, you're, you're an important person and it's important that you be around me. Right? That it's, uh, having that positive outlook and that positive interaction is something that is very fundamental. So um, there's some spiritual strategies that, that I can recommend to kind of help us in general dealing with this haste. Number one, what do you guys think? The lowest hanging fruit to help me not be hasty. Absolutely. Okay, I, I would say even before that. Done. It's the easiest one. Right? If, if I feel I'm hasty, what can I do? I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to remove that hastiness from my heart. That is the easiest thing I can do. And I can actively try to engage it. And then, I can start acting on it by having salt, right? by showing forbearance, by having him, by, by trying to practice it, and understanding that uh, I need to put these things in perspective. Even even paradise, like, is paradise given us to, today? No. <laughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he's going to give us paradise when he feels like giving us paradise. If he gives us paradise, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to enter it. I mean, uh, seeking refuge in Allah. And, and I think that's something that's very powerful in the moment because it gives me perspective. Like, okay, where is this hurriedness, where is this hastiness actually stemming from? Is, is, it, is it real or is it perceived? Because sometimes we perceive it and, and it's not real, right? There, it's not, there's no real pressure there. We just feel that there's pressure there. So doing istiada and seeking refuge from uh, the shaitan is something that is very important and can give us that perspective. Um, Knowing that we're accountable for our actions. I think that's something that's really important too. That I need to make sure that whatever decision I'm making, I'm thinking it through. And in general, in general, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us a two-stage approach to making decisions. What are those two, two stages? Yes. Huh? Okay. Uh, what else? I heard, I heard someone mention something. Istikhara, good. Uh, istishara, right? So, in general, making istikhara to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what, what is that? That's basically asking Allah to bless my decision. And seeking shura, seeking counsel from others. If I want to make good decisions, I ask others who are relevant, right? I need to make sure that I'm asking people who are relevant to help me make a better informed decision. I make a decision, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless that decision, and I move forward. And you know what that does? It takes away some of the burden of the decision making on myself because now I have other experiences to help me make that decision. 
is it necessary that I'll be successful in whatever I decided? No, it's not necessary. But at least I can stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and say, Ya Allah, I took all of the steps that you asked me to take before I came to the solution. So whatever happened, this is because he had written it. And I can take solace in the fact that I did everything that I was supposed to do. Uh, having to look in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, trusting him. And, and, and sometimes this can be very difficult and it can be very challenging. But, but basically, understanding that I only have control many times over the means. Right? I can put my seatbelt on, I can make sure that my, my battery in my car is charged, I can make sure that there's gas in the engine, I can make sure that the car is clean, I can make sure there's air in the tires. Right? I can take all of these steps. Can I guarantee I'll reach my destination? No. Right? That, that's up to Allah. But all of those other things, I have to do them because this is something that Allah obligated me to do. I have to prepare. And it's the same thing here. I, if I have taken all the means, I have to trust the results to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And like I said, it's, it's scary, right? But that's what iman is. That's what faith is. Putting that trust in that space that, okay, I've done everything I'm supposed to, regardless of what happens. That's of Allah, I get into an accident, or I get hurt, or maybe even I make it to my destination. It was all up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and I had no control, and I had no say. Um, there are some practical strategies uh, that, that I was able to find. Uh, mindfulness, breathing, counting to ten, uh, delayed gratification. Some of these are actually spiritual also in nature, right? Understanding that whatever decisions I make or whatever it is I, that I do, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reward me in the afterlife. I'm not, I might not necessarily receive that reward in this world. Uh, setting priorities, having that perspective, that's something that's really important. If I'm able to set my priorities, if I plan my day and I set my timings, right, and I'm making sure that I'm well planned, then these are different ways to kind of remove a little bit of that anxiety because I know that I've already set time for these different things and for these different events. Um, seeking advice, creating a plan, uh, reflecting on consequences. Again, uh, some of these are, are very close to the spiritual strategies that the Prophet Muhammad said that even advised for us and for us to engage with. Uh, stress management. And, and I think that's something that's really important. And again, that's more of a conversation on subtle, on, on what that is and having that emotional intelligence and how to channel our different emotions. Right? There's nothing wrong with being angry or sad or happy, but how am I channeling those feelings? Because if I'm not channeling them correctly, usually what will happen is they'll bottle up, they'll appear in the form of stress, and I might uh, display that emotion in an in inappropriate way, and I might actually end up hurting others. So that's why some of these things are important. Uh, setting boundaries, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that when we talk about relationships. Uh, and how uh, how is it that we actually set boundaries with others? To what extent? When somebody crosses those boundaries, how am I supposed to deal with that? And again, you know, those are conversations we'll have when we get to that discussion with the Daitara. Uh, learning from our mistakes, and I think that's important. That's part of the experience. Right? We will make mistakes. There's no doubt about it. Uh, and, and it doesn't matter how many people I seek advice from. I still I still can make that mistake, and I have to make sure that I'm learning from that, and make sure that I'm humble enough to uh, to correct it. Um, and uh, therapy. Therapy is not bad. Uh, I, think, uh, I think seeing a therapist is good for, for many people. The only condition I put on seeing a therapist is make sure that you have someone who is not validating what you're saying. That's not what you want. You want someone who's actually setting milestones, somebody who's setting goals, and somebody who's actually giving you strategies. If they're not giving you these three things, change your therapist. If they're not these three things, if they're not there, you need to change your therapist, Muslim or not. You get rid of this. The, the job of the therapist is to give strategies, whether they be emotional uh, thermometers, whether they be understanding like you know the different tiers of the different relationships, understanding like relationships, like those are all strategies which I think are very helpful. But you need to have goals, you need to have milestones, and you need to have strategies. If those are not happening, you need to change your therapist. So these are just some of the things that I have. Uh, we ask Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala to to make us very deliberate in our actions. We ask Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala to to bless us and all of the decisions that we make, and to give us tawfiq, and to bless us in how to make those decisions, and to seek shura, and to seek istiqara from him.